uh, would be lifted next week as planned, but uh, it seems not. Yeah, that looks uh, pretty unlikely. Um, let's take stock of where we are with virologist Dr Chris Smith and Professor of Public Health, Linda Bold, as ever. Lovely to see you two together. Thank you very much Good indeed uh, for joining us. So, I mean, we, be, we know that the Prime Minister is going to make a statement uh, later this afternoon. It looks like as it's likely to probably be delayed. Uh, Linda Bold, is that, do you think, what's likely to happen? Is that the right thing to happen? I think, Louise, morning. I think it is likely to happen. I think we've been hearing ministers implying this over the weekend, interviews yesterday, and obviously you've had um, the minister on the program earlier, giving, I think, a pretty clear signal. If you look at where we are in the data, Professor Andrew Hayward was saying yesterday, if you're not quite sure what's around the corner and you're driving, you don't accelerate, you decelerate. And I, I think that's what's happening. We're just not yet clear, as we've discussed many times before, about the link between the proportion of people vaccinated and what's happening with people going into hospital. And I think the final point I'd make is, again, as the minister was saying, you know, we still have over 11 million uh, people in the UK adults with, who haven't had a vaccine. And we need to get the 43% um, the of people who haven't had a second dose. We need to get more of them having that second dose. So buying extra weeks will provide greater protection and greater assurance, I think. Chris, if we look at the, the, the graphics and all the data over the last few days, you, you see that, you know, clearly cases are rising. Um, do you think, does that amount to a third wave? Are we now in a third wave? Uh, you know, some people say if you talk to the World Health Organization, we're still in the first wave because the infection is still sweeping across the world. Number one reason we've been in a lockdown. And when you're in a lockdown, people's contact is minimised. Therefore, the prospect of people transmitting viruses to each other is minimised, so you get fewer cases. The second thing is that we have had a new variant introduced onto the scene. This is a new kid on the biological block. It's this Indian subtype 2 variant, which spreads better. We had hoped to be, by a certain point, in terms of risk and vaccination rates and so on, that is now judged to be potentially insufficient to head off the trajectory of this new variant, which is why the policymakers are saying perhaps we have to slow down what we do in terms of opening up a bit to allow the vaccines a bit more of an advantage to compensate for the advantage that the new strain of the virus has. I'm not sure who you is best placed to answer this question, but who can, and we've talked about this so many times, um, you as well on this programme, about um, the effects of the variant, you know, the, the vaccine and this variant. Who wants to pick up that, what you can tell us the best about that, the, you know, how effective it is and what needs to be done? Why don't I pick up on the real world studies and, and Chris yeah. is the expert Great. in the lab. So, okay. <laughs> so what we know from the analysis that's been done of people who've actually received the vaccines, um, we can see that the effectiveness is less definitely after the first dose for all the vaccines actually and strengthened after the second dose. But in the face of this Delta variant, the important thing is that the first dose only provides about a third of protection. Um, when you get to the second dose, the level of protection is similar to what it was against the B117, the so-called Kent variant. So that's real world data, but it emphasizes the importance of the second dose. Over to you, Chris. Uh, well, part of the reason that we're, we're a bit concerned about this Indian subtype 2 variant, this Delta agent, is because you do need both doses of the vaccine in order to get the level of protection that we were achieving against the, the so-called Kent variant, to have both doses of the vaccine comes in. And the other thing I think to, to bear in mind is that with these variants, they also change the performance of the virus in other ways. They can make it more infectious to a person. They can, we are still learning how that's happening with this Indian subtype 2 variant, but we get the impression it is potentially 60 or 70% more transmissible. Mm. So in other words, we're seeing 60 or 70% more cases than we might have otherwise anticipated within the same amount of time. And that is why the R value, we, we heard late last week, the R value has crept up to between 1.2 and 1.4 again, showing that the outbreak was shrinking. It's now switched to a state of, of increasing again. Linda, my maths is, is shocking, but um, I'm trying to work out, I mean, if we, if we say then have an extra month uh, with the current restrictions in place, an extra month of people getting vaccinated, you're not necessarily talking about a huge amount of people being fully protected at the, at the end of that month, are you? If you need an extra two or three weeks after your second vaccine, you've still got a lot of people potentially uh, exposed to this virus, uh, you know, come the middle end of July. 
You still do have a proportion, but let's bear in mind the age gradient. So as I was saying previously, you've got about 43% of adults who haven't had a second dose um, who will be eligible for one. You're right, John, you're not going to get to all of those people in that one month. But what you will achieve is you will achieve more second doses for people in their 50s who haven't had it. Most people in their 50s have, but we still have some to protect. People in their 40s, people in their 30s. You're right that my 18-year-old son, who's due his first dose, uh, next week is not going to get his second dose by then. But by protecting older groups, I think we will have more population immunity, and that will mean that the link that the government is so concerned about, rightly, with number of people in hospital will be even weaker. So that's why even those four weeks are important. And of course, he gets that because he presumably, like you, lives in Scotland, and there are all these different var variations of that, of who gets the jab too. Um, can we just talk about that, Linda, actually? Because, of course, we talk, we've been at a fan zone uh, today. Um, also, other things are beginning to open up, and there is, you know, Euro 2020 going on. Are you concerned that, you know, there are going to be more people meeting, even if they are in outside spaces? Yeah, this is a good point, Louise. Well, first of all, let's just say that um, it's a long time since Scotland was in the Euros and I was a lot younger and we're all very excited about the match against the Czech Republic today. But moving, moving on from the football. Um, so we there are concerns. So the fan zones, uh, people are being recommended. Now, these are outdoor areas. In fact, Chris was speaking about this in the media in Scotland yesterday. They're outdoor areas. The risks are far less. They will be managed. But people are being strongly encouraged to take up testing, even though the testing isn't perfect. Perfect. What I'm more concerned about, Louise, of course, when we have something to celebrate, people may gather in each other's homes, including in larger numbers. Um, and if a goal is scored, they'll be embracing and, and you know, people will be um, close to one another. So I think the public health message is, you know, if you can do it outside and celebrate outside, please do. And just avoid the, the large gatherings in each other's homes at the current time, because as Chris has been discussing, you know, infections, uh, there are averaging between five and 6,000 a day now, including in Scotland, we've got numbers that we haven't seen for a little while. <clears throat> so we want to keep those numbers down. Um, listen, thank you both very much indeed for your time as ever. Uh, great to talk to you. Uh, Linda, I can't let you go without saying congratulations on your OBE as well. So well done. <laughs> thank you both very much. Would you rather have the OBE or a Scotland win today, Linda? Oh, well, I think everybody in the nation would give me a hard time if I said the OBE. <laughs> so go, go Scotland. <laughs> Good for you. Thank Thanks you both. very much indeed. And, and it's not Saturday morning. If you've seen the two of them on the air this morning, you think, oh, what? They're always on on a Saturday. Yeah. It is Monday. Uh, you haven't uh, lost a couple of days. Um, we have an update. Well, it's not an update, is it? But uh, it, it is a good update. excitement. Go it, on. Is, it is an update. And isn't it interesting? Almost every guest, no matter what subject we're talking to them about, is going to talk about the Scotland yeah. game today because there is a real sense of anticipation building. It is a momentous day in Scotland.